Claudia, thank you very much. Uh, I think what the, uh, this issue of identity as defined herself is different to an outside actor, and I think here of Russia and its uh, current foreign policy behavior, which is undermining the principle of European integration, will be a factor in the future. But that's a question that we will discuss later in the questions. Then. You end it with uh, extreme parties, which I think this is wonderful. Um, segue to the next presentation by Jeffrey Stevenson Burr, who comes to us from Scotland and is a uh, specialist in political extremism, group violence, ethnic conflict, and political terrorism, a fruitful lens of collective identity formation, which is very relevant to what you've been talking about. Uh, he has big interest in this part of the world, so I think you will hear uh, interesting things. Thank you, thank, and thank you for, for inviting me, uh, and thank you all for, for coming. I look forward to, to the conversation. And um, forgive me, I, I'd like to move about a little bit, so I feel a bit constrained to present from the, from the table, so I'll take um, I'd like to say just a, a couple of, of things in response to, to what Claudia has already added, just to, to kind of uh, locate my own research, and then we can see how I do think that the, the papers are very complementary, and then we'll see how it relates to Daniels, I think we've got very good synergy on, on this panel. Um, my interest is, is largely in the movement between identity, particularly as direct action groups, to political action groups, to political parties. And so in this discussion, um, I want, I'm, I'm going to be looking at far right groups. Some of the groups that I mentioned are very extreme. I don't want to lump all of the far right in with Eurosceptics, but I do want to show how those, those two groups uh, relate to one another. And like Claudia, I come at this from a very uh, social constructivist standpoint, particularly for me, a psychosocial uh, standpoint. And so we'll talk a little bit about the psychological, social motivations of people to join extreme groups. And in this sense, I'm very interested in the connection between the way that parties try to tap into existing discourses. That is, that parties don't only shape voters, but rather parties may actually be reflecting discourses that are already available in a larger setting. Perhaps giving them language, as Claudia mentioned, language is meaning making, and often then by providing that language, to make a message perhaps less vulgar. So th there's a very important uh, connection here. I would say I'm a qualitative, I don't know, political scientist, I'm not very scientific as a political scientist, so a political sociologist. Uh, what I'll be presenting here is largely based on uh, my own qualitative research, which is um, interview-based and personal observation at political rallies, particularly here in Hungary, uh, Yobi rallies, also going back to me uh, rallies, but also in other parts of Europe and the work of some of my, my PhD students. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so just to, to set a frame, since we've been talking about this uh, already, I, I thought I would just begin the presentation with some numbers. These are, you know, obviously people can contest different polls. Um, these are largely all presented from uh, Euro Voice, um, which, would, which amalgamated uh, different polls. But just so that we have the basis of conversation, since we're talking about different political parties, um, as of the 11th, uh, UKIP was leading in the polls at 32%. This was actually a survey of um, uh, YouGov for the um, Sunday Mail. We'll talk more about this in the afternoon. I'm sure Julie will have um, quite a bit to say um, about this. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, it's quite possible that UKIP, the Independence Party, wanting to get Britain out of the European Union, is leading the polls for the European election. Likewise, a very different kind of party, but also one that I think is quite important for our conversation, is the Front National in France, 24% also leading in the polls. And likewise, right, the, the Danish People's Party is also leading in the polls on 26%. And they seem to actually be surging, so this is quite possible that they'll do even better. Jubik, in terms of percentage, right, is not leading, and certainly not leading, but looks like they will repeat their parliamentary performance in terms of the list vote 
in fact, battering it to 22% over the 20% that they had gotten uh, back in April. And then the, uh, uh, the, the Freedom Party in the Netherlands is also leading in the polls um, slightly less at 18%. I think this becomes quite important if we look then at the, the party in Austria also polling on 20%. Now, in this case, they're in third place, but we're seeing high levels of support for these kind of populist movements. And likewise, the, what had been the true Finns, now the Finn party is also leading, or not leading, also in third, uh, but around 18%, so doing quite well. Uh, the Golden Dawn and the Lega Nord, 8.5%, 6%. Um, and then some of the uh, kind of other mentions, the Vlaams de Lagang in, in uh, Belgium, and uh, the Swedish Democrats and the Slovak National Party between 6 and 4 percent. What becomes important here is what most of these groups represent. And I think in this regard, we can actually see uh, a contest between what Europe could be and what it might not be. And I think in this regard, we're not just talking about nationalists. Um, this was a quote that came from yesterday from the Deputy First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, who definitely wants independence for Scotland, but wants to be inside the European Union, and actually sees voting for the Scottish nationalists as being a way to oppose what she called the dismal anti-European, anti-devolution agenda of, of UKIP. So in this case, voting for an independent Scotland is a vote for Europe. So it's not just nationalists who are against Europe, and I think this is also applicable to the situation in Catalonia, where the Catalan independence movement largely wants to be part of the European Union. However, something that also just recently came out, uh, this is from March, was a new video from the British Nationalist Party, British Nationalist Youth Speak Out, Fight Back, and they ask a question, who's responsible for the ongoing attempt to, eradicate, to radiate the British culture and British identity? They ask a whole series of questions about immigration, about the degradation of British identity, about loss, about the loss of jobs, the loss of control. Again and again they ask these questions, and they ask the same question, who is responsible? And the response is not us. And I think this becomes a very important symbolic politics, because in this regard, they see themselves as somehow disempowered, and then looking for those elements who have taken all these things away. And they answer their own question by saying, who is responsible? They say it is an unholy alliance of bankers, militants, homosexuals, capitalists, Marxists, and I love, right, the capitalists and Marxists go together, but <laughs> everyone in Hungary knows, right, this was Istvan Cherka's favorite slogan, right, liberal Bolshevism. And it's one thing in the same, right, linking the Marxists and the capitalists together, they become a united enemy. And in fact, we can see this over and over again, right? The idea, this is from an Arab Cross poster back in 1937, I'm sorry, I, I thought the image was here, but it just didn't come up in the Prezi, so forgive me this. But you can imagine the images, they are horrifically anti-Semitic images of uh, a big banker with a very rotund belly in his, you know, in his tuxedo morning uh, uh, jacket, uh, the Marxist worker with his red star cap, uh, with a you know kind of a, a five o'clock shadow, and then this this shtetl Jew with you know, with a very dirty looking right three images above, and the arrow cross says, "Fight with us against our enemy." Now this language becomes so important because it unifies us in seeing the enemy. Who is the enemy? Well, in this case, the capitalists, the Marxists, and here we have a third category: the the beggar or say the What's interesting is to see the repetition of this trope. So we can actually see very common so reinvocations of these kinds of creations of enemies, where uh, basically, as you can see from the Hungarian National Front, this was on a flyer that was distributed uh, in 2012, right? A bulldozer is destroying our country, and the blade of the bulldozer is the gypsy criminal, 
right? The idea of gypsy crime, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a parallel to seeing the kind of shtetl Jewry in the, in the Arrow Cross being directed by the Zionist Jewry driving the bulldozer. Um, I think if we look at statements that come out of the Golden Dawn about immigrants, and similarly from the True Friend, the True Finns, which also is a vehemently anti-immigrant party, but would see itself on the far left, not on the far right, it repeats very similar discourses. And in fact, the Swedish Democrats ran a television commercial in 2012 in their parliamentary election, where they did relatively well on 7%, uh, that basically showed a woman, well, a number of women in burqas pushing prams, right, running up to a, a pole lever, and the pole lever was to a bucket of money. And these women in burqas, right, were behind a bunch of elderly women pushing their walkers, and the women in the burqas, right, pushed the ostensibly white Swedish women out of the way to be able to grab, right, the lever to get the money. I mean, I think the repetition of who becomes a common enemy is, is an important one. And in this sense, what binds all these together is a kind of narrative of laws. And I would like to add that it's, it's a narrative of laws, not just in we might have lost the pot of money, uh, but it's also a narrative of laws of what might have been. It becomes a, a narrative of a lost future. And those who don't feel the loss, are part of the same corrupt uh, elements that have made that, that future destroyed. So in this case, the appeal to the, in both the Aerocross poster and some of these other posters, of our enemy. If you don't find these people the enemy, you are not us. And I think this becomes a very important mechanism by which some of these very extreme groups come to speak for the nation. If you aren't upset about immigration, in the UK, you're not really the kind of Brit that UKIP wants. And if you cannot feel like all the ways that we feel, if you don't feel this pain, then you're among the corrupted. You are actually part of them. And it becomes a very an instrumental way of excluding other political elements uh, within the group. It also becomes a way of reinforcing who is us. So the Golden Dawn has actually been quite good, good, uh, effective, that's probably a better word, quite effective at creating a sense of solidarity amongst Greeks by providing food kitchens. Now, in fact, the mayor of Athens has outright banned Golden Dawn from doing this, and yet they continue to, to, to do this as a way of saying, only Greeks can get our food. Now, who gets to define Greekness in this case? The Golden Dawn, right? So anyone who might look like a Marxist they, they get no food, right? Anyone who looks like an immigrant gets no food. Anyone who's a person of color gets no food. And likewise, in Italy, I don't know, this slide probably doesn't show it very well. This, this is uh, the Casa Pound, uh, the house of Ezra Pound. It's a fascist house. If you are a good Italian, and your house is being foreclosed upon by evil Marxist capitalist bankers, right? you can go to Casa Pound and get a loan. Casa Pound will help you find a job. Casa Pound will help you um, get food if you need food. They have a food bank, but you must be a good Italian. So in this sense, by being a good Italian, then you also become the kind of Italian that Casa Pound wants. And so in this sense, the discourse gets shaped in two different ways. And I'd like to introduce uh, the British uh, sociologist, I guess, anthropologist, Benedict Anderson's notion of an imagined community, which is a very large social space in which all of the members cannot meet face to face. Um, but they feel connected, socially connected, because everyone in the community imagines that they share something. Now, in a positive sense, which is what Anderson was writing about as a nationalist project, we share values, we share some kind of norms, we even share experiences. But I'd like to and, and, and this offers a very important notion of horizontal camaraderie, right? It's a, it's a way of equality. We're all the same. We all have the same vision for the future. So, in a sense, we can create within this horizontal unity a kind of vertical social status, those that maybe believe in this more than others. And in this, we can think about 
my security is in relationship to how others perceive me in this group. So do people see me as a good Italian? Do I have social standing inside of my group? And in this sense, it's, it's a question of social capital in, in the Bourdieuian sense, so the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. My sense of value, my sense of belonging, my sense of identity is rooted in my perception of my social status within my group. But we can turn Anderson on its head, on his head, and actually see that we can talk about violent imaginaries, a community that's held together by having a shared sense of the same enemies, a shared sense of the same legitimacy of violence against another group. And so building on uh, David Rich's uh, Anthropology of Violence, his Violent Triangle, uh, I'd actually like to, to say that we could change our understanding of political violence or anti-immigrant violence or anti-Semitic violence or anti-Roma violence from one that's largely made in a dyadic fashion between the victim and the perpetrator, where we look at the motivations of the perpetrator vis-a-vis -vis who the victim is, as if this is an important relationship. But I would like to add that there's an audience for whom these acts are done, and this audience may be, and more often than not, is one's own group. Have I actually showed an expression of the values of my group? So one of the ways of obtaining social capital is actually repeating the narratives of, of violence. So we can think about narrative performances as older <coughs> social capital frames. If I am excluded from the dominant mode of social capital production, i.e. average society, um, I can find it elsewhere. And so uh, a person at a Yubik rally in October said to me, right, the West is doing it to us again, right? It's the same thing as Trianon, it's the same thing as 1989, and now the West is trying to keep us down again. So the EU, as a symbolic object, is responsible for 1989. I'll get to that in a second and is responsible for Trianon. So it becomes an interesting question. If you're an anti-communist, as most Yobi people are, what's the problem with 1989? Right. But in this regard, the, the trope from Yobi is the European Union stole the future of an anti-communist Hungary or a non-communist Hungary. So all of that was dreamt of by Churi and Churka and so many other supporters of me in the late 1980s into the early 1990s, poof, it's all gone. And that becomes the lost future, right, this potential future of 1989. So we see then at uh, Yobi rallies, I don't know if, the, if you can see it in the back, but you see people wearing t-shirts of these skeletal hands right, pulling apart the kingdom of Hungary right, from the Trianon crisis as a repetition of this kind of Europe pulling Hungary apart, or destroying Hungary. And at Edge has, there was a, a long time, there was a sign of uh, Trianon, of the Kingdom of Hungary, right, literally being crucified, depicted as being crucified right, uh, from 1920. But this is a statement about contemporary 1990s politics, or then contemporary not a statement about 1920s politics. And now, of course, if we go over to Sabashak Ker, that this sign has been replaced by a statue of Admiral Horthy. And if you're offended by that, then obviously you don't feel the pain of true Hungarians, right, who feel the pain of, of this. So just to kind of bring this to, to a close, I mean, part of what we're seeing in some of the Euroskeptic uh, movements, or in Beyond that, actual anti-European movements is a kind of claim for what's ours. So this idea of, I don't know how this translates, but this photograph is of members of the European Defense League, the EDL, which sees itself as completely different from the British Nationalist Party and is also different from the UK party. But they are an explicitly anti-Muslim party. And they're very responsible for often boarding trains in areas of, of great diversity in, in South of England, and intimidating, and you can see the intimidating this woman in a, in a hijab. Um, likewise, the photo on the right is uh, a sticker that was actually placed on Agnes Heller's office at Elta, 
uh, which many of you may know about, this happened uh, last year in March, and it basically said, Jews, right, the university is ours, signed the Hungarian students. I mean, this makes clear right, that the university belongs to only Hungarian students, and Jews are somehow not Hungarians. In a way, it becomes this redefinition of who is inside the group and who might be the legitimate target of, of violence. So to see these kind of symbols repeated becomes a mechanism by which the European Union is a symbolic object, an enemy object, that is external to the domestic politics and therefore becomes a legitimate target of violence, but also a legitimate target of projection of all that people feel that they've lost. And I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. So thank you.